For better picture quality, adjust traffic CR. Once in the forest on the shores of the great lake we call Lake Michigan, lived an Ottawa Indian boy. The boy had a name, but everyone had forgotten it. They called him Lazy Bones, but they said it with a smile. For the boy wasn't really lazy. It was just that he was always, wa always wandering by himself. Sometimes he would watch the women pounding corn Sometimes the boy watched the men before a hunt making arrowheads out of flint. But the boy didn't help them. In far into the woods, always quiet, always watching, he saw where the red squirrel hid its nut, saw where the deer drank, and where the wolverine left his big paw marks. He had one friend. A little girl named Gray Fawn, and he told her stories about the woods. The woods and I understand each other. The trees are my friends. The birds and bees are my friends, and the animals come at my call. Oh. For they are all my friends. One morning, Gray Fawn went to gather berries, and by late afternoon, she had not yet returned. The men of the tribe found her moccasins near the lake, but they didn't find Gray Fawn. The chief, her father, cried angrily, she must have been captured by the Saginaws. The men painted their faces and prepared for war. <laughs> While the men prepared for war, the boy called Lazy Bones went to the shore where Gray Fawn's moccasins had been found. He said to himself, if Gray Fawn had been captured, she would have dropped her berry basket. I don't think she was captured. I think she took off her moccasins to go wading. He looked along the shore until he found a footprint in the mud. He said, she came out here and couldn't find her moccasins. He sang, my woodland friends, tell me where is Gray Fawn? Which way did she go? Oh, tell me, please, that you know and your signs I will follow to her. Oh, Gray Fawn and I. When the boy sang the song, a porcupine that had been gnawing young willow shoots stopped and stared at him. The boy said, I think Gray Fawn went this way to gather willow splints for a basket. He looked, and he found places where the willow shoots had been broken. He followed the trail among the willows into the forest. My woodland friends, tell me where is Gray Fawn? A squirrel ran down a tree trunk and stopped his nose pointing. The boy looked and saw where Gray Fawn's bare feet had disturbed the leaves. Which way he go? A rabbit jumped out of some bushes, and the boy looked and saw where Gray Fawn had pushed through. He thought, she knows she is lost and is too frightened to look where she's walking. Oh, tell me, please that you know and your side I will follow to her gray fall gray fall
Just then, a flock of crows began to scold angrily. The boy went to the noise, for he knew that crows will scold when they're disturbed by someone who has no weapons. There, under a tree, he found Gray Fawn. The boy took Gray Fawn by the hand, and they set out for home. See, there! And when the men saw the children, they laughed with relief and joy. And the chief, Gray Fawn's father, put his hand on the boy's head and said, Now I will give this boy a name. I will call him Little Hawk, for he has the sharpest eyes of all the Ottawas. <laughs> Paul Bunyan was just one month old. He placed his baby hands around a young maple tree and tore it out of the ground roots and all. When he was only 18, he was already 25 feet tall and weighed 800 pounds, all bone and muscle. He took one look at the deep forests of the West and found his job to chop down the trees to make room for cities, farms, and people. Come all you sons of freedom that run the forest stream. Come all you roving lumberjacks and listen to my theme. We'll cross the roaring rivers where the mighty waters flow. And we'll roam the wild woods over and once more a lumbering go. And once more a lumbering go, and once more a lumbering go, we'll roam the wild woods over, and once more a lumbering go. Paul Bunyan was so tall, he covered miles with every step. Why, one day he started walking across the country. He walked across Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and then stepped into the state of Wisconsin. There, he met an old farmer, his head bowed down with grief. The farmer told Paul his story. I'm going down the road feeling bad. Oh, my crops have failed and now I'm feeling sad. My family is hungry and we have no place to live. I'm going down the road feeling bad. And with five blows of his axe, Paul Bunyan cleared a space of 10 miles for a brand new farm. Thank you, Paul Bunyan, cried the farmer. You're welcome, said Paul, as he took an extra big step and walked from Wisconsin into Montana. Yes, Paul Bunyan did some remarkable things, all right. As a soldier in the Revolutionary War, he faced a whole line of cannon. As the Hessian soldiers fired at him, he picked up a tree trunk and batted their cannonballs right back, like baseballs. Once, when pirates were roaming the east coast of the United States, he splashed his foot in the ocean and started a wave that sank the whole pirate navy. Oh, and I almost forgot, he also built the Rocky Mountains. Paul grabbed the hill with either hand with a ring ting a tim ring a tin on a and set them down so they would stand in a row. He built the Rockies up so high the topmost peak held up the sky with a ring ting a tim ring a tin on a. Then came the biggest job of his life. The country had no inland waterway large enough for big ships carrying heavy freight. So, Paul Bunyan began to dig. 
soon he had scooped out hundreds of miles of earth. Now he wanted rain, so he clapped his hands together. And down poured the rain. Until the holes in the earth were filled with the Great Lakes. Now, one of the Great Lakes was named Lake Erie, and the town of Buffalo was on its shore. It took just another day's work for Paul Bunyan to dig the Erie Canal from Buffalo to Albany, and the inland waterway was completed. In his later years, with his big jobs done, Paul Bunyan went back to one of his favorite hobbies, mountain making. But this was a mountain for children, a rock candy mountain. Oh, the buzzing of the bees in the popcorn trees near the chocolate ice cream fountain where the jelly beans grow and the milkshakes blow down the big rock candy mountain. Oh, the children eat their fill of the whipped cream hill and no one's ever counting. There's so much to eat. Life is one long treat on that big rock candy mountain. Did Paul Bunyan... Well, nobody knows for sure. Oh, mighty Paul Bunyan. He lived long ago. His strength and his goodness helped America grow. Right one morning, Peter opened the gate and went out into the big green meadow. On a branch of a big tree sat a little bird, Peter's friend. All is quiet, chirped the bird gaily. Just then, a duck came waddling round. She was glad that Peter hadn't closed the gate and decided to take a nice swim in the deep pond in the meadow. They argued and argued. The duck swimming in the pond, the little bird hopping along the shore. Suddenly, something caught Peter's attention. He noticed a cat crawling through the grass. Oh, look out, shouted Peter, and the bird immediately flew up into the tree. While the duck quacked angrily at the cat, Grandfather came out. He was angry because Peter had gone into the meadow. It's a dangerous place. If a wolf should come out of the forest, then what would you do? Peter paid no attention to his grandfather's words. Boys like him are not afraid of wolves. But grandfather took Peter by the hand, led him home, and locked the gate. Sooner had Peter gone than a big gray wolf did come out of the forest. In a twinkling, the cat climbed up the tree. The duck quacked and, in her excitement, jumped out of the pond. But no matter how hard the duck tried to run, she couldn't escape the wolf. 
He was getting nearer. Nearer. Catching up with her. And then he got her. And with one gulp, swallowed her. In the meantime, Peter, without the slightest fear, stood behind the closed gate, watching all that was going on. He ran home, got a strong rope, and climbed up the high stone wall. One of the branches of the tree round which the wolf was walking stretched out over the wall. Grabbing hold of the branch, Peter lightly climbed over onto the tree. Peter said to the bird, fly down and circle round the wolf's head. Only take care that he doesn't catch you. The bird almost touched the wolf's head with his wings, while the wolf snapped angrily at him from this side and that. How the bird worried the wolf and how the wolf wanted to catch him. But the bird was clever, and the wolf simply couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Peter made a lasso, and carefully letting it down, caught the wolf by the tail, and pulled with all his might. Feeling himself caught, the wolf began to jump wildly, trying to get loose. <laughs> Peter tied the other end of the rope to the tree. And the wolf's jumping only made the rope round his tail tighter. Just then, the hunters came out of the woods following the wolf's trail and the shooting as they went. But Peter, sitting in the tree, said, Don't shoot. Birdie and I have caught the wolf. Now help us to take him to the zoo. Imagine the triumphant procession. At the head. After him, the hunters leading the wolf. And winding up the procession, grandfather and the cat. story and listen to it well. I'll tell you of a great man who served his country well. His name was Daniel Boone and he wore a coonskin hat and his clothes were made of buckskin. Now what do you think of that? Dan was born in Pennsylvania in 1734. In colony days before the Revolutionary War, he was famous as a hunter while he was still a boy. And the hours he spent in the forest, they were his greatest joy. Did you hear that? That was Daniel Boone with his long rifle out hunting a bear. Listen. <laughs> He got him. 
Daniel Boone shot that bear. That was when Daniel was only 15 years old. Yes, Daniel Boone was the greatest hunter and explorer this country ever had. Now, sometimes Dan hunted bears. And sometimes wild cats. And other times the timber wolf. Daniel Boone loved to explore, too, and he was one of the first pioneers to see the Blue Ridge Mountains and the blue grass region of Kentucky. Oh, Daniel knew the forest, he knew the forest well, the mountains and the rivers and where the animals dwell. He was handy with a rifle and with a hunting knife, and he loved the open spaces, the cleanest kind of life. Of course, there were other dangers in the forest in those days besides wild animals. There were Indians, and one day when Daniel was exploring a cut in the mountains where Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee meet, an area known as Cumberland Gap, he knew there were Indians ahead, unfriendly Indians. Quickly, Daniel turned around, and silently he cut back on his own trail, but the Indians were behind him, too. Dan was surrounded. Dan fought like a wildcat. But the odds were just too great. He was captured and taken to the Indians' camp. The Indians knew Daniel's reputation, and they tied him to a tree post to prevent his escape. That night, when the Indians were asleep, Dan found a sharp piece of bark right back of where his hands were tied. Slowly and painfully, he rubbed the leather cord against the bark until at last he was free. Then, as quiet as a cat, he escaped. The Indians followed, but Daniel covered ground so fast that he left their swiftest runners behind. He covered 160 miles on foot in four days, and he met his friends, settlers from back east at Cumberland Gap. During the Revolutionary War, Dan was a major in the American Army, and his great knowledge of forestry and wood lore came in handy when he fought the British and the Indians on the British side. But he was friendly to many Indians because... Daniel was a fair man to red men and to white, and he never used his rifle unless he had to fight. He didn't like big cities, he kept on moving west, and he helped to build our country and tame the wilderness. When the Revolutionary War was over, Dan kept heading west until he made his final home in Missouri. There he would sit under a tree during the day, and settlers and Indians came to him with their problems, for he was a man of great justice and simple democracy. His tree became famous as Boone's Judgment Tree. Often Dan sat under it and remembered his old battles and adventures, and he would fondly dream of his hunting days <coughs> when he hunted the big bear and the savage wildcat and the wild timber wolf. And now you've heard my story, there is no more to tell. The story of Daniel Boone, who served his country well. His clothes were made of buckskin and he wore a coonskin hat. A democratic pioneer, I hope you'll remember that.